Paul Gauguin, the artist, moved to Tahiti. He, moved, he lived in Hawaii. And while he was there, he heard that his favorite daughter, Aline, had died back in Holland. And in response to that news, he painted an enormous canvas, um, which was, in a sense, a cry of anguish at the riddle of existence. And on the top left-hand corner of the painting, he slashed in French three questions. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? And these are the kinds of questions that come with the big brain, uh, with our ability to speak and to develop ideas. They come with being human. Uh, human beings are an object of interest to themselves. And as far as we can tell, the other animals are not. We know we're going to die. Uh, we're puzzled at the very existence of things. Why is there something and not just nothing is one of the great philosophical unanswerable questions, but nevertheless, one of the questions that comes with our humanity. The human animal is an animal that's an object of interest to itself and asks questions about the meaning of life. Is there any meaning to the universe at all? Is there an agent behind it? How best should we live? These questions come with being human. And as far as we can tell, we're the only animal on the planet that asks them. We are of an object of interest to ourselves. And what I want to um, suggest today is that these questions have prompted three great human enterprises, which in a sense are ways of answering the big questions, religion, philosophy, and science. And what I want to do uh, with my time this morning is to focus on the kinds of answers that religion has given to these big questions in a very general, very broad, summarized way, and the responses that our society today makes to these particular claims and questions. And I'm going to suggest, and I've got one slide alone, I'm going to suggest that there is a, a line, a continuum, a spectrum of responses to these big questions, the kinds of answers that religion gives, and the kinds of responses to religion that are in our society today and may even be present in this audience. And before I actually get into talking about what's on that line, I need to um, look at two other things. How do we get answers? How do we get the material, the data, that informs the way we answer the questions? And the obvious one is the big brain, rationality, the human mind. We are equipped with this astonishing organ which enables us, through language, to ask questions, to explore, to experiment, to discover. Um, and you can therefore say that human rationality is the great instrument which enables us to answer or to offer answers to some of these questions. Now, religious people claim that there is another source of data. It's a controversial claim, but I want to enter it, and we will think about how you uh, respond to that claim. Religious traditions, not all, but most of the big religious traditions claim that there is another source of information, another source of data. And the shorthand word is revelation. And let me offer you a metaphor uh, to try and capture, try and get you thinking about it before I actually launch into my spectrum. I don't know if you remember a science fiction movie that featured Jodie Foster some years back. I've forgotten the name of the movie. It's about people trying to discover if there's life on other planets. Um, and they have various devices that try and listen for signals, for broadcasts. Um, is there someone trying to communicate, get in touch with us? Well, religions claim, at certain stages, religions claim that there was originally messages, uh, revelations, if you like, uh, broadcast messages that came from the beyond, from the other, from the possible ultimate source of everything. Um, and usually three, 4,000 years ago, this original broadcast happened, and at the time it was taken down in a kind of a rough minute, a rough text in response to that, and that becomes what religions call scripture, um, the Bible, 
the Quran, uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, at, at, at the heart of religions, there are these great texts which they claim, as it were, to be information that came from beyond uh, about the meaning of things and how humans should live. So two sources of data that religions deal with, rationality, the conclusions of human thought, and this mysterious claim that there is some other source of information as well, some inspired product from some original encounter with ultimate mystery, a record of which has been kept, which has been debated over, cherished, destroyed, argued about. That's prologue. So let me now launch into what I detect are various responses to the big questions and particularly along the religion, the religion spectrum. And I'm offering you a line here with four notches on it, um, going from left to right, going from a kind of uh, dark blue right over to a dark red. So let me now try and explain what I'm meaning by this. Um, the first notch on my spectrum I call strong religion. And theologians also describe this particular point of view as divine realism. The claim is that there is a real God, a real ultimate mystery, a real meaner, who in some sense is the agent of everything that is. The reason there is something and not nothing is because of the agency of that mystery. So there is a real being, a real mystery, a real God. Pick your language, it's always inexact. And there was a real broadcast. There was a real revelation. And it was recorded accurately, inerrantly, infallibly, absolutely, and for all time. And so it gave humanity a package, as it were, for permanent guidance as to how to understand the universe and how to live within the universe. And I call that particular position strong religion. And its advantage, of course, is that it's very strength, it's very certainty, it answers all your questions. If you've got a problem about how to live, whom to sleep with, whether you can sleep with anyone, you'll get it there. How you understand the nature of the universe, you'll get it there. It's a package, and it gives you the security of certainty. However, it comes with certain consequences that to my point of view, are major disadvantages. Because what it does essentially is it locks you into the worldview of a long time ago. Not only, as it were, the scientific worldview, but the social, the relational worldview. It will lock you into a particular attitude to women, for instance, because most of the religions that formed at that particular time formed in patriarchal societies, and they will have inherited points of view that were to do with the way culture and society organized themselves at that time. So they will probably uh, hold to some understanding of the subordination of women, that women are in some sense inferior to men. Um, they will have very stringent understandings of alternative sexualities, for instance, uh, the problem um, one of the major problems that they face is in dealing with new understandings of sexual minorities. Um, so it puts you on an ethical collision course with some of the best discoveries and social reforms and changes of our time. But it does something even more significant. It, it, it puts you into an epistemological collision course with the best understanding of humanity. The word epistemology comes from the Greek word for knowledge. And if you buy into a strong religious picture, you buy into a permanent, as it were, absolute understanding of human knowledge. You buy the science, if you like, of 3,000 years ago. So it puts you on a collision course with other scientific discoveries. One of the most obvious collisions, and this was one that happened um, in the late Middle Ages, was when it was discovered with the invention of telescopes that maybe the Earth was not the center of the universe, that the sun didn't go around us, maybe it was the other way around, um, that, that, that we, in fact, 
were in a solar-dominated universe, not an Earth-centered universe. And there was a big collision about that. Uh, Kepler, Galileo, uh, Copernicus, a big struggle because the Bible clearly taught classical astronomy, which was um, our planet-centered. So the strong religious position, uh, which gives you, uh, if you want it, certainty. It's a bit like having uh, all answers to all your questions guaranteed, a kind of absolute divinely guaranteed knowledge. But in, in adhering to that particular position, it puts you on a collision course with new knowledge, with new understandings of how best to live. Um, and it's actually, in some ways, quite a defiant posture. It's quite strong. Uh, it's sometimes called fundamentalism in our society today. And it's a, it's a new, as it were, a violent ingredient in the debates that are going on among humans about how best to live, how best to respond to the interaction of cultures when they suddenly come up against points of view uh, that they themselves do not share. I said, essentially, its great virtue is the strength that it gives you, but it gives you that by turning off history. And one of the things that we know about our species is our changefulness, our dynamism, our, our restlessness, our searching for new understandings, uh, not only of how to think about the universe, but even how to relate to one another. We, we heard from Professor Jones this morning, even how to speak. Uh, when you compare uh, the kind of cut glass broadcasting accents that I grew up with in uh, the 50s when I listened to the BBC and you had these people speaking in extremely cut glass accents and they, they talked about Edinburgh Castle and things like that. And if you listen to old um, uh, newsreels, you get that. And now think of the way broadcasters on the news, on television, speak with regional accents. And Professor Jones gave us a very interesting example of the way his students speak today compared to the way they did 50 years ago. Uh, there is something about the human that is inherently dynamic and changeful. The strong religious position offers a kind of absolute monolithic, unchanging certainty, which is its attraction to many people, but of course it simply stands there in the midst of the storms of time and does not relate to the fact that history changes, um, that we move on, that we change our ideas, we change the way we dress, we change the way we think, we change the way we speak, we change the way we are religious. Which brings me to my second notch, on this continuum that I call weak religion. And let me try and explain that a little bit. The person in the weak religious part of the spectrum does believe in a real God and does believe that there was indeed a real revelation. There was, if you like, an original broadcast. Um, but the person in this position has a certain kind of realistic skepticism about the human animal. Um, believe that the human animal is prone to getting things wrong. Um, if you want to stick to the um, broadcasting metaphor, it's not that there's anything wrong with the signal, but the receiving sets um, are pretty inadequate, and we get it garbled, we don't get it right, we don't get it neat. This is sometimes called by uh, theologians critical realism. There is a real God... Um, but we humans are so flawed and faulty in our understanding. Ask three people uh, to describe a road accident they saw on George Street this morning, and you would get probably three different points of view. There's a celebrated story about a Russian drama teacher who used to illustrate this to his, um, his students by arranging uh, three actors to rush into uh, a, a class like this, a lecture theater, uh, and they would, as it were, fight with each other. It was, it was a dramatized thing. And then they would dash out. And he would ask the students to describe what they'd seen. And he would get almost as many different descriptions of what had happened as there were students who'd actually claimed to have seen it. So there is something about the human mind, the human animal, um, that is flawed in its perception of things, its take on things. Therefore, Theologians describe this position as critical realism. You have to be modest. You have to be, um, have your critical wits about you when you're evaluating uh, religious claims because you can't be absolutely certain that you've got God right. There is God, 
Um, but you get God filtered and mediated through your own human understanding. And you can easily make the mistake that your understanding is God neat. Whereas it's simply the way you, you get God. It's simply your understanding, your perspective, your view. And you see things from where you stand, from where you sit. Which is why the world's religions tend to see God differently and talk about God in an almost contradictory way. Therefore... To the person in the weak religious position, there's a kind of modesty in the religious claims they make. You can't be too certain uh, you've got these things right. Um, Be a bit suspicious about your claims to absolutism. Um, uh, Just just be careful that you are actually getting hold on truth and not simply your own particular prejudice, your own particular projections, your own wishful thinking, the way you would like things to be. Um, one way of describing the weak religious position is through what I call um, the story or the parable of the two tunes. There was a famous American modernist composer called Paul Ives, and he discovered as a young man that he could hear two tunes in his head at the same time and hold them, quite a difficult thing to do. Um, And his music actually makes use of that, uh, to my untutored ears, it's a bit difficult, a bit dissonant. Uh, but he, he's able to listen to two apparently competing tunes. The weak, the person in the weak religionist position does that, listens to his or her religion, um, is a devout member of that religion, uh, wants to belong to that family, believes it carries a lot of beauty, a lot of wisdom, um, a lot of poetry, Uh, But there's also a person living today, uh, reading the science of today, reading the philosophy, uh, the sociology, um, uh, uh, following the politics, is very definitely someone living now and not then. Not living with the strong religionist back then, two, three thousand years ago, but living now in 2009. And therefore trying to listen to now, listen to today, its best science, its best thought, but also trying to listen to the tradition uh, that nourished her, the tradition that brought her up, as it were, uh, with particular ways and forms of religious guidance. It's quite a difficult way to live. There's a kind of tension between the two, and it does provoke a kind of modesty. And um, one of... uh, Let me look at, at two or three aspects of the weak religious position that enable it actually to, to respond to the kind of things that Professor Jones uh, talked about this morning. The person in this position is listening uh, to the world, uh, mind still active, taking in new knowledge, and therefore adapts the religious position to the new knowledge. In other words, um, does not read, for instance, the creative myth in the book of Genesis as science, but will understand it in a different way as a pre-scientific, narrative, poetic way of trying to answer why there is something and not just nothing. And it does that through uh, the form of myth, poetry, and some of the loveliest texts in history are of that sort. Um, When you read a great poem, you do not necessarily analyze it scientifically. You may analyze it emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. You try to find meaning and message in it for your own life. You do not treat it as a scientific datum, but as something else. And so to the person in this particular uh, slot on my spectrum, they are adaptive, uh, not only to, to, to new knowledge claims, they will adapt as they did to the great Copernican revolutions, uh, the great astronomical discoveries, they will adapt to science in all its new and exciting discoveries, and they will adapt and did adapt to Darwin's great um, discovery, Darwin's big idea uh, about the evolution of species. Usually after a struggle, because there's no doubt at all that most religious positions are inherently a bit skeptical of change, Uh, They're a bit conservative, they they need to be persuaded, but they gradually come to terms with the new claims that are being made, uh, not only in knowledge terms, but in ethical terms. And in my own church, we struggled for a long time uh, with the status of women, um, because for most of the 
the history of the Anglican, uh, of, of, of the Christian church, women had not been allowed to be ministers. And it was only in the last sort of uh, 30, 40 years um, that they actually started debating the possibility that women might actually be fully equal to men and therefore could be um, ordained as Christian ministers. So weak religion gradually, and in, to this extent, they're almost Darwinian in their ability to adapt to change. They adapt themselves to new knowledge, to new social and ethical discoveries because they believe that the, the human is inherently dynamic and changeful. And if you're going to have a going religion that is valid for all time and not simply for back then, then it has to listen and be adaptive and respond to social change and to scientific change. Of course, it opens itself to uh, criticism, this particular position. Um, the strong religionist will claim that it's uh, conforming to the world, that it's no longer simply listening to God and the purity of scriptural truth. It, it's, it's going after fond inventions. It's hoarding after false gods. It, it's listening to secular culture, and it's changing its mind. Um, and it also gets knocked uh, by secular critics, because on the whole, secular critics like religion to be obscurantist. They like to think that it is an absolutely fixed thing that they can strongly and passionately disagree with, but they admire it for the courage of its contrariness, if you like. And here you have people who claim to be religious, but who also claim to be responsive to science, and they are described as wishy-washy, as not knowing uh, their own minds about things because they occupy this quite difficult position of listening to the two tunes, of trying to be faithful to the best of a religious tradition and also trying to listen to the best thinking and social understanding of today. So that's my second notch, the second notch on my continuum. Let me um, move to uh, my third notch, which I call after religion. Um, and this position is still broadly sympathetic to uh, the religious tradition. It believes that it has brought um, into uh, the human experience um, a lot of beauty, a lot of meaning, um, some interesting values, and is not simply to be dismissed. This position is sometimes called non-realism, the first position, realism, a real God, a real broadcast, really true. The second position, critical realism, a real God, but there's something about humanity that doesn't actually get reality real and therefore be modest, be provisional, don't be, don't be so sure you've got things absolutely right. The third position after religion, non-realism. There's not a real God. Religion is a human construct. It's a work of the human imagination. It's the way over the centuries we have provided answers to these big questions, the, the what are we, where do we come from, where are we going questions that come with our humanity. Um, they're, in a sense, the way, one of the ways religion has wrestled with the big questions and they still carry enduring meaning and value. Don't dismiss them. Don't be arrogant and simply say that because you no longer believe that there is, a, as it were, a real ultimate mystery out there that communicates with us, that it's all made up by us, that it's therefore something to be dismissed. Because given that it is the record of humanity's struggle with meaning and mystery and explaining itself and understanding how best to live, surely by looking at it, by interrogating it, by digging into the data, you will discover things about yourself. Because if it does come from us, if it is a work of the human imagination like a great novel or a great opera or a great symphony, if it's something made by us, then it must contain useful knowledge, knowledge useful to us. Um, and let me um, spend a little time thinking about what it does actually tell us. And if you study the great texts of religion, the great scriptures, uh, they're full of sublime beauty and wisdom, and they're full of horror as well. Uh, there's a lot of talk about evil and hell and sin. Uh, where is that coming from? Um, if you belong to this particular position on the spectrum, you will look on the great uh, religious traditions, the great 
religious narratives and stories as almost a kind of uh, an upsurging of the human unconscious, the human experience of its own conflicted nature. So it's a way we're actually looking at ourselves. And we know that we, um, the brainiest animal on the planet, are also capable of incredible cruelty, not only towards the other animals with whom we share the planet, but towards one another. There is something uh, terrifyingly, um, there's a terrifying potentiality for cruelty in the human creature. You only have to study the wars of the 20th century. You only have to think of the great purges, the great genocidal um, uh, frenzies that characterized uh, Europe. I'm thinking of our own continent in the 20th century. Um, uh, the purgings by Stalin, the Holocaust, um, of, of Hitler and his fascists and the wars that we constantly fought on our own continent um, in the last century um, and we're still, of course, fighting uh, one another in all sorts of pocket wars all over um, the planet. Therefore, um, the after-religionist will say there is something in these dark religious narratives that's actually telling us something about ourselves they're almost like a blot test. They're actually saying, yes, there is something complicated. You're a wonderful animal, the human animal. You have this immense brain, this ability uh, to um, evolve language, to write love poems and, and, uh, and lyrical essays, but also um, to, uh, to write blogs full of hatred, um, to uh, develop ideologies that traduce the humanity of other human beings, other religions, other members, uh, members of, 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 a, of another gender. There is something about us that's dark as well as full of light and potentiality for good. Um, and the fact that we constantly struggle with each other politically, racially, religiously um, shows that there is something in this great dark under continent that religion expresses in its scriptures that's still worth interrogating. Um, let me uh, give you another distinction uh, that's worth remembering when you think about religion because it's very easy for people who know little about religion to dismiss it um, as something that actually has nothing for them at all because they do not believe in, as it were, the big father in the sky. And what I'm wanting to suggest to you is that any tradition as long and as old and as rich as that is, it, it is worth at least respecting and exploring. Let me offer you another distinction. When the Greeks use language, this greatest invention of the human, and as Professor Jones um, has told us, itself almost um, the engine of our own evolutionary powers, our own ability to adapt and change and discover. When the Greeks uh, used language, they made a distinction between, between two kinds of discourse, two kinds of language. There was logos, um, which in a sense was factual discourse. It's the word that you find in theology, in biology, in graphology, in anthropology. Uh, it's the factual study of um, of a particular aspect of reality. And then there was mythology. And mythology um, was what the Greeks in particular, that was the word they used to describe the stories that humans told themselves to try and explain themselves to themselves. And these were not factual, they were imaginative. They were like great novels, like great poetry, but they carried meaning. Um, uh, just because a novel is a fiction does not mean to say it is untrue. The question you ask of a myth is not is it true or is it false, but is it living or is it dead? Is it still carrying some kind of meaning today about the human condition? Let me give you one precise example, the one uh, that Professor Jones started with, the story of Adam and Eve. That's not a story um, about an Aboriginal couple uh, who uh, were uh, existent in an existing garden somewhere in Mesopotamia. It's a myth. Um, and being a myth, the question you ask, does it still convey meaning today? And I believe that it does, because in fact, what the story of Adam and Eve and uh, the fruit of the forbidden tree being tempted by the serpent, what it's telling us is there is something about the human condition that is intrinsically discontented. 
um, that we're never content uh, with this year's mobile phone or this year's car or even this year's boyfriend or girlfriend or fashion or fad, um, that there is something about us uh, that is almost intrinsically uh, incapable of a kind of emotional and psychological stability. We know that. It, it, it's, it's that reality that's behind every breakup of a relationship, every breakup of a family, uh, every dispute in a school context, every fight in a playground. There is something about the human um, that can't have enough. We, we overdo things. We inflate. And in so doing, of course, we're risking our own um, life on the planet. We're lifting the planet itself because there is something about us that overdoes things. Um, and so what this, this myth of the fall is telling us and the way to read it is not as a historic event about something that happened back then, but about something that happens right here and now in our own society, in our own city, in our own community. It's about us. And so what you, what you do uh, with religious stories is you treat them with myths that carry meaning. And you can still interrogate them. You can still learn much from them. After religion is in some ways quite an interesting position in today's spectrum. A number of very interesting philosophers started rediscovering the value of religion, not in any supernatural sense, not claiming that it puts them in touch with the real ultimate mystery. I think the jury, frankly, is still out on that. Um, and I think that the default position is a kind of agnosticism about how can our finite brains comprehend um, the notion of ultimacy. Uh, and, but it, 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 it is quite difficult for certain of us, not all, but a lot of us have the kind of mind that can't leave those questions alone. William James, the American philosopher, uh, said there were healthy souls and sick souls. I'm sick. Um, I've got the kind of mind that's constantly asking these big unanswerable questions. I just can't leave them alone. I don't find answers that I can, as it were, hammer other people over the head with, but I've spent most of my life struggling with moving from one position to the other, uh, find myself almost on the edge of all of them, but still awed at the mystery that there is something and not just nothing, that this universe is so extraordinary and there's something in me that can't but ask possible questions of agency. Never answered, of course, but that, in a sense, is it's that kind of posture of wonder, of uncertainty, of expectation that prompts some of the great religious narratives. And those great stories still have meaning that we can dig out today. And it's quite interesting to me, as I was saying, that some of the most... Um, subtle philosophers of our time have started revisiting religious narratives um, because they think that they contain um, the minds that contain a lot of human riches. Um, so after religion, still uh, basically sympathetic to this extraordinary enterprise, but, as, but in a humanistic way, seeing it as a great art, a great work of the human imagination, something that we should actually be quite interested in and quite proud of. Let me move uh, finally to uh, the fourth notch on my continuum, um, which um, I describe as absence of religion. And I want to pick my words carefully here because I don't want to appear to be patronizing to people in this position. It's a position I profoundly uh, reflect. Um, uh, but it's kind of difficult not at least to suggest two possible analogies color blindness, tone deafness. There are some people that don't get certain colors. There are some people uh, that, that don't pick up subtleties in tone. Um, and there are some people that just do not have any interest in religion at all, whatsoever. Um, an increasing number in Northern Europe, but not necessarily in other parts of the world. They just do not get religion. They do not have the religious gene, if there is such a thing. They're supremely uninterested in the big questions. Um, they find it quite enough to be getting on uh, with life as it presents itself. On a lovely sunny day, you do not agonize, whence cometh this day? You get out uh, the picnic basket uh, and you go off and enjoy it. Life is its own meaning. It simply is. Get on with it. Enjoy it. Don't agonize about it. And there's a certain kind of healthy-mindedness about this particular response. 
And it's, in many ways, the prevailing mindset, I think, in our culture with certain subtle variations at different ends. It comes in two forms. It comes in a weak form. Um, and the weak person in whom there is a complete lack of interest in religion, uh, the weak version of this isn't hostile uh, to everything else in that spectrum, may even occasionally be kind of wistful. Julian Barnes, the great um, novelist, uh, wrote an astonishing book last year about death um, called Nothing to be Afraid of, ironic title because he's very afraid of death, um, and the fact that we know we're going to die um, is one of the things that makes humans a, a, an animal that suffers from a kind of fear and anxiety and perplexity. He began that book by saying, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Uh, and there are people who maybe um, never had God or maybe given up God, but they still miss the kind of security, the kind of comfort uh, that it gave. And uh, the people uh, without religion, complete absence of religion, um, who have the weak version of this particular approach um, uh, can sometimes be quite wistful about those who have what they call faith and certainty of conviction. Uh, they don't attack those who have it. They might be mildly amused um, at someone believing in the existence of an imaginary friend in the sky, but hey, if it comforts you, I'm not going to try and knock that. Um, more interesting and more um, assertive in our culture today is the bit right um, at the end of my spectrum, the strong version of the absence of, of religion notch. Uh, and these are people who, who, who themselves don't get religion, uh, but they also don't want anyone else to get it either. They're very hostile to it. Um, they, they, they want to root it out. They want to extirpate it because they think that it's bad for humans. Um, and this claim can be based on moral outrage, a religion as the source of evil. Uh, Richard Dawkins is probably uh, the most eloquent exponent of this point of view. He said in his book, The God Delusion, uh, quoting another thinker, um, that anyone can get evil people to do evil things, but only religion can get good people to do evil things. And he opposes religion um, as the root of all evil. He did actually uh, produce, uh, present a series of programs with that title. Um, it's not actually true that religion is the root of all evil, because human evil and cruelty have attached themselves to almost any human enterprise, including football, politics, um, as well as religion. So um, I would suggest that the root of all evil is in our own complex and divided nature, which can use any modality, even science. It was scientists that gave us uh, nuclear weapons. Um, it was scientists, if you like, that gave us Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I, I was at um, a symposium in this very theater um, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, a number of nuclear physicists were here and we were talking about science's guilt in the fact that it did enable these monstrous weapons that have the potentiality to destroy the planet. That doesn't make science evil, but it does demonstrate uh, that the human, complex human animal can use almost any good thing for evil purposes. Um, and therefore, I think that Dawkins is wrong when he says that religion is the source of all evil, but I do respect his moral outrage because undoubtedly religion has provoked intense struggle and cruelty. It's burnt witches, it's burnt heretics, um, it's persuaded um, naive young men to fly planes into high buildings and kill 3,000 people within living memory. Um, there is something about religion that can um, turn um, uh, the human animal into a kind of uh, ferocious, implacable monster. Uh, but then politics has done the same thing. Um, and the atheist Stalin did it um, uh, with his armies as well as many uh, religious maniacs. So I think that the fault is in us. The fault is in um, humanity and not in any particular modality. There's a very violent debate going on today about all of this. Um, it's actually quite fascinating. There's a kind of new um, evangelical atheism um, and it's intriguing that uh, many of them are very, very passionate followers of Darwin, and they ignore his own advice, uh, writing to his son in 1880, 
Darwin said that though he was a strong advocate of free thought on all subjects, it appeared to him that direct arguments against Christianity and theism produced hardly any effect on public opinion. He went on, freedom of thought is best promoted by gradual illumination of men's minds, which follows from the advance of science. It has therefore been always <clears throat> my object to avoid writing on religion, and I confined myself to science. Let me um, draw to a conclusion here and to offer uh, a couple of comments. I believe um, that atheistic attacks on religion can be good for religion because um, they can get it thinking and revising. And I believe that religion, if it's to have any value, has to be adaptive. It has to, in a sense, be evolutionary. And in fact, it has historically been evolutionary. And I've tried to show that um, in my little spectrum here this morning, um, that it's, it's adapted and survived all sorts of changes and challenges. And sometimes atheistic attacks purge it of superstition, of silliness, of false thinking, gets at thinking and revising. And interestingly enough, most of the developments in religious thought have been labeled at some time or other as atheism by a previous a version of religious thought. Christians uh, were labeled atheists um, uh, within the polytheistic structure of the Roman Empire um, uh, because they had a different take on religion. So I think that on the whole, this debate that's going on is both interesting in itself I think it's also very good um, for theologians to engage with it because it purges them of wrong ideas. The second point I would make is I do not think that you can understand any human enterprise, institution, or phenomenon if you have no sympathy for it, um, if, if, if you just don't get it at all. Um, and I want to quote a famous French history of religion, uh, Renan, who, who wrote... Um, a revolutionary book about the life of Jesus. And this is what he said. To write the history of a religion, it is necessary firstly to have believed it. Otherwise, we should not be able to understand how it has charmed and satisfied the human conscience. But in the second place, to believe it no longer in an absolute manner, for absolute faith is incompatible with sincere history. I like the balance of that. Um, you need to have a kind of a sympathy for it, to have known it, as it were, from the inside, but you need to um, relativize it and to move on and no longer to hold it in an absolute way um, uh, because that's incompatible with sincere history. Let me now offer um, a few words in conclusion. I think it's likely that we are drawn to our position on this particular spectrum by factors not entirely in our control. But even if we claim to have made our decision on purely rational grounds, um, I think we need to exercise a certain kind of magnanimity towards people with whom we might disagree. Because there is something to be said, if only emotionally, for each position on uh, the spectrum. Um, it can be challenging to stand up for your own position without rubbishing others. Nevertheless, I'm not um, advocating a kind of wishy-washy inability to criticize. I think some aspects of the strong religious position can result in cruelty, uh, can result in outlawing my gay friends, for instance, and I'm just not prepared to stand for that as a person who, in a sense, is res residually religious myself, I want to battle for a religion that's humane and open and compassionate, open to new knowledge. And so I want to challenge more obscurantist versions of it. But nor do I want totally to disturb the ways that people get through life. Um, I quite like something Frank Sinatra said. He said he believed in anything that got him through the night. Well, I don't quite believe in anything that gets you through the night, but life is complex. It can be very frightening for many people, and religion has been one of the ways in which a lot of people have found the ability to get through and to cope um, with horrible, horrible uh, experiences. I had a public discussion debate with Richard Dawkins at the Science Festival last year, and I quoted to him, um, and we agreed probably on 
as many things as we disagreed. And I quoted, I think, one of the greatest of the Holocaust novels, the novels about that horrifying um, Nazi experiment, the final solution, getting rid of six million Jews in the gas ovens of Europe. Um, and this novel called The Last of the Just by Andrew Schwartz-Bart is about the last um, just man. It's a kind of Jewish myth. Um, and he um, dies in Auschwitz. And at the end of the novel, he's on his way to Auschwitz in a boxcar um, on uh, the, the, train that, the trains that took them there to the gas ovens. And he's, he's surrounded by children because he's found himself in uh, a train load of children going to be gassed. And um, half of them are dead. They've died of dysentery. And he's got a little girl lying across his lap. They're all emaciated. Um, and they're asking him, where are we going? And he tells them a lie. Um, he says, we're going to Jerusalem. Um, and you'll meet your parents. Uh, and and uh, you'll be fed. And, and you'll be comforted. And life will be joyful again. Um, and his girlfriend, Golda, is sitting beside him. Um, and she whispers at him, um, you know that's not true. You know that's not true. How can you tell this lie? And he said, there is no room for truth here. Because in that extreme situation, to offer a comforting lie is probably the most appropriate truth. And Richard Dawkins said he would have done the same. Now, that doesn't justify religion, but it does show that in extreme ultimate situation, sometimes... Um, a, a, a tender fiction is as much as you can give someone to get through the horrible night that's engulfing them. Um, I want to end with a little poem I love. I interviewed um, Yehuda Amakai, um, an Israeli poet, a, an atheist who lives in that city, maddened by religion, because Jerusalem in many ways is the cockpit of the kind of hatred that religions can uh, ev develop for each other. And he wrote a poem that seems to me to be capture some of the things I'm trying to say this morning. This is how it goes. From the place where we are right, flowers will never bloom in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. The message being that sometimes our certainties can be crucifying, so beware of them. Thank you.